You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Executive Nurse Advisor Dr. Batchelor will present the significant role nurses play in providing health care in a multitude of health care settings. Listen to some of today's key nurses who work and practice in academia settings and talk about the challenges they face in today's modern medical world. So please welcome the host of All About Nursing, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Good evening. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I have, I have two outstanding guests with me here this evening, and my first guest that I would like to tell you a little bit about is Susan Reinhard, who is the Senior Vice President at AARP, and she directs its Public Policy Institute, the focal point for state, federal, and international policy research. She also serves as chief strategist for the Center to Champion Nursing in America. She is a nationally recognized expert in health and long-term care with extensive experience in conducting, directing, and translating research to promote policy change. Previously, she served as co-director of the Rutgers Center for State Health Policy, directing national initiatives to help people with disabilities live at home. She served three governors as deputy commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. Her research and policy expertise includes healthcare workforce, caregiving, consumer choice, community care options, and quality. She is a former faculty member at the Rutgers College of Nursing. She is an American Academy of Nursing fellow and holds a master's degree from the University of Cincinnati and a PhD from Rutgers. My second guest I'd like to tell you a bit about is Elaine Ryan. Elaine is the Vice President of State Advocacy and Strategy Integration in the Government Affairs Department of AARP. She leads a team of legislative staff who work with 53 state offices to advance AARP's state advocacy agenda with governors and state legislators throughout the nation. This work is to enable individuals age 50 plus and their families to attain and maintain their financial and health security. Elaine earned her Master of Public Administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and a Bachelor's in Economics from Fordham University. I'm delighted to have both of you on the show this evening. Thank you so much. I would like to start with you, Elaine, if you could tell us a little about uh, how you began your career in nursing and and how it led you to what you're you're doing currently today. So, Joyce, I think that's about me, Susan, although oh. Elaine is welcome to become a nurse at any oh, time. I'm so sorry. I fixed that up. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry that's okay. Up. That's okay. <laughs> she's my right-hand person, and she's a lot of her is about a nurse. But but let me, uh, let me just say that I started, as all nurses do, working with individual patients and their families in different settings, like a hospital, and I became a visiting nurse. And um, basically what happened to me, at least, is working with people one at a time, right? So you might have this problem, and how can I help you? And then I see another patient, and how can I help you? And I started realizing that a lot of my opportunities to help uh, weren't under my control. They tended to be under the control of whoever the payment source was. (laughs) So I could get orthopedic shoes for one patient, but not for another, unless uh, that person happened to have a payment, like an insurance company that paid a certain thing, or Medicaid or Medicare, which isn't really taught, at least it wasn't then in nursing school. So that was a real education for me. And I started trying to explore that, like, how can I, you know, kind of lift it up and and certainly keep helping people one-on-one, but can I figure out ways to help more people 
uh, at a time. And that brings you to policy. I often say that for nursing, at least, policy is nursing intervention at a community level. So that's kind of what brought me into it. And I started working with things around like hospice, you know, so uh, people at that time was is pretty new, like, okay, so you can stay at home. You don't have to go to the hospital. You'll get lots of care and support in the home. But then when your loved one does, uh, does go on, then the medical examiner has to come and pronounce death before the body can be released. And yet that's kind of silly because the family is ready to move on. So can nurses at least pronounce that the person is no longer living and let the doctor write down why. These are, they seem like simple things, but I realize then you have to go to a state legislature in that particular case. And then I had to figure out, okay, I must have learned in sixth grade how a bill becomes a law, but I don't remember that now. <laughs> so I started <laughs> joining my professional association and like, okay, how does this thing work? And who exactly is my state legislator and, and can they help me? And so it was, th- it was very specific issues that I was facing as a nurse, that I was trying to figure out how to solve and realized I needed to reach out to others who knew a lot more about me than me about how to make that possible. And eventually I wound up working with um, the State Nurses Association and then I went uh, and from there you get on different, you know, people start to know you because you're asking a lot of questions, I suppose, and serve on different advisory committees and Eventually, I was appointed Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health and Senior Services in New Jersey, which, um, you know, really, I had this passion around family caregiving, which we can talk about more, but it was mainly because that's who I was working with when I was a visiting nurse. So how do we help them? Uh, And and then I went on to do more work at the federal level and uh, tried to work with different states and how they could improve services. Um, in their own states. And and then I got a call from ARP that said, hey, would you like to join us? And I thought, well, here's a chance to join an organization that has like 38 million members and uh, lots of people like Elaine that you'll hear from in a moment that can take some of these ideas and really make things happen more than I could do alone. So that's how I got to where I am. Well, that's awesome, and um, thank you so much for sharing that. Elaine, I think you're now an honorary nurse. I did that for you this evening, Um, and I'm sure that it's based on a lot of the work that you've been doing. So tell us how nurses and nursing issues impacted you personally as a family caregiver. Well, thanks so much, and I will accept that honorary title, although (laughs) although I'm not worthy. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll say that um, I was a family caregiver for my mom and pop for about 15 years. And um, the central force and the central source of information for all of my parents' needs uh, were nurses we met along the way. And so whether it was in the doctor's office or uh, in home health, uh, in the hospital or in rehab centers, believe me, I've been to them all. Uh, uh, The nurse was really uh, the quarterback uh, of the team. And uh, in terms of patient satisfaction, Uh, Both of my parents uh, weren't much on uh, following every detail of their condition or every detail of what they needed to do uh, to get better more quickly. Uh, The nurse in our family's life, uh, two of them, both named Sue, by the way, so there must be something (laughs) going on, Uh, but uh, nurse uh, Sue Um, They were our go-to resource, and uh, I can't say enough about how information is power, and it gives patients the power uh, to heal. And in the nurses I've had in my caregiving experiences will really, uh, that information source, uh, telling us about the medication, telling us about condition, Uh, giving us information about warning signs, 
uh, letting us know uh, when it was time uh, to get um, uh, more help or different help. And so uh, in that journey of 15 years, I won't bore the listeners with all the many conditions my parents had from brain surgery to uh, prostate cancer. Uh, it was really the nurses in our family uh, that um, that allowed my parents to live, uh, I'm sure, uh, five years longer than they otherwise would have. Thank you so much for sharing that. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and it's time to take a short break. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show. And I, again, have two very distinguished guests with me this evening, Susan Reinhard and Elaine Ryan, who both work with ARP and have just amazing experiences and accomplishments. One of the things that I would really like to have them share with the audience a little bit more is the work that they've been doing based on ARP's family caregiving research and key findings from reports called Home Alone that was done in 2012. That was the first national look at how family caregivers are managing medical surgical nursing tasks, such as giving medications, changing dressings, and other tasks in the home setting that are typically performed by trained nurses and professionals in the hospital. And a second research study called Home Alone Revisited that was repeated in 2019 and built on the work of the 2012 Home Alone Report. Home Alone Revisited took a deeper look at variations among multicultural groups and investigated generational differences. Difficult tasks, such as preparing special diets, managing incontinence, and dealing with pain were explored in depth. This was just amazing work and really shows how family caregivers might be unpaid, but as your research shows, it's not free. The the care that families provide takes a lot on the caregivers in terms of being able to take care of their older loved ones, and it's the backbone of our health and long-term care system. I think having our listeners really grasp the magnitude and impact of family caregivers would be something that maybe, Susan, you can start to share a little bit more about uh, in terms of this very important work that ARP has been involved in. Sure, I appreciate that opportunity. And first, um, first of all, many of your listeners are family caregivers. There is absolutely no doubt about it. There are 41 million family caregivers, and they are providing about 34 billion hours of care to their, when we say family members, we mean family, spouses, partners, friends, neighbors, people that are in their lives that they're helping. 
And, you know, it's, it's free care. And this is what they're doing. And if you really wanted to count it up into how much would it cost to actually pay them, it would be $470 billion. Billion dollars. We actually have that information by state, but it is a staggering amount of uh, contributions that family caregivers are go- doing. It's invaluable to the people that they're caring for, but when you think about it, it's invaluable to the entire nation that we are that these family caregivers are stepping up and doing all this kind of work. I call family caregivers a precious national resource that we need to make sure that they have what they need to keep doing what they're doing without really having too much uh, hardship on themselves so that they can do everything else they do. And uh, a couple of things that this uh, research has shown is that we we tend to think of family caregivers as women, but 40% are men. And that's important. You know, men are stepping up. About one in four, so 24%, are younger people, millennials. It's not only, you know, the woman in her mid 40s or 50s that is doing this of course they are but also younger people are quite involved and 40 percent represent multicultural communities so i like to unpack that you know we have certain images of what a family caregiving is but it's all of us frankly it's all of us you look around and that's what it is and people are doing a lot you know they are helping certainly with driving people to doctor's appointments and doing shopping and cooking and they're, um, they're doing other things like helping with finances, but they're also doing this care, which is what we called home alone. They're doing more and more complex things that I was taught as a nurse, nursing student, and I often say like the first time I was doing it, or maybe the first five times I did it, I shook a little bit when I gave mm-hmm. an injection or changed a wound dressing or you know gave a tube feeding or even managing a lot of different pills all these different pills we have to give it's not just one or two it's like 10 so there's a lot of things that are going on and family caregivers 60 percent of them are working so they're doing their job then before they go to their job and after they come home and on the weekends they're doing all of this kind of work uh and so they are um they, you know, it has a lot of implications for their job at work. And the other thing is we like to point out that as the aging of society continues, where, you know, we're getting an older as a society, that there are going to be fewer and fewer caregivers for every person who is, let's say, 80 years or older. And that's when they definitely need or more likely to need caregivers. So, you know, a few years ago, we had about seven potential caregivers for every person who is 80 years or older. And it's just like a sleigh ride down a hill. So by 2030, which is only like 10 years from now, we're only going to have four for every person. So that means, again, my scarce resource. That's why I say that. So this study that we did called Home Alone, I won't get into a lot of detail, but it does talk about half of family caregivers. So 20 million caregivers, 20 million people are doing this very complex care, and they aren't getting much instruction on how to do it. They're worried about making mistakes, and, uh, you know, they're saying, I need more help, which um, we can, I guess, maybe turn to Elaine if you would like to talk about what we're trying to do about that. That'd be great. Elaine, if you could share with us a little about what's, what ARP is trying to do, that would be awesome. Well, sure, and uh, one great pleasure I have of working at ARP is working uh, with Susan Reinhardt. Uh, her research has been really seminal in the area of uh, caregiving, uh, but even more, it has prompted um, a call to action. And so uh, Susan and I were discussing the Home Alone report, and um, we sketched out a, uh, a set of things that state legislatures could do to actually change the law uh, to support family caregivers more fully. And so that became um, the CARE Act, the CARE, uh, uh, the CARE Act that um, is now law in uh, 43 states. And uh, we started our effort in 2014. 
uh, 43 states later, we've uh, we've been able to enact these laws to support family caregivers. And I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about what's in that act and how it helps uh, family caregivers um, as we move through the program. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and we will continue this conversation when we come back. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting uncultured aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents listen wednesdays at 9 a.m eastern on bold brave media and tune in radio animal lover author artist and public speaker patricia daily life is a renaissance woman in her own right a lover of animals from a young age patricia lives on a farm in virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses keeping them or finding them safe havens she is also a published author and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio. And before the break... Elaine Ryan was telling us a little bit about the uh, Home Alone uh, policy work that they're doing to try to really address the kind of complex needs uh, people have when they leave hospitals, for example, and the kind of care that families find themselves in charge of. And as, as I was listening to all of that, I was thinking to myself, having been a chief nurse in my former role, how we had so much competency training and oversight and coaching and mentoring. And yet, bam, we're discharging people home, and then family members are to take over. And I know when I first started in nursing school, we always stressed that discharge planning starts on admission, and that's been a long time ago. And I would like to say we've made huge strides, but I can't. I think that we're still many times realizing it's time for this patient to go home, and we're rushing at the end to try to then get them discharged. So. You know, Elaine, if you could tell us a little bit more about like what you're really trying to do with the CARE Act, I think our audience would really enjoy that. Great. Well, uh, the CARE Act has three uh, specific provisions, and each of these provisions are part of the laws in 43 states now. First, when anyone goes into a hospital, anyone of any age, um, the law provides that uh, the name of the family caregiver needs to be included in the admission record. Uh, number two, uh, during and throughout the stay, the hospital stay, uh, the law provides that family caregivers who are identified uh, upon admission are actually kept informed throughout that uh, patient's hospital stay uh, and, and given adequate notice prior to discharge from the hospital. And as you all know, that it's often a very uh, delightful occurrence when someone's told, you know, your loved one's going home, except for the fact that families have literally nothing prepared uh, to be able to bring their loved ones home. So adequate notice prior to discharge in the third provision, uh, which I think goes to Susan's research and and is really perhaps most important, and that is that 
uh, that family caregivers will be offered the opportunity for a simple instruction of the medical tasks that they'll be asked to perform on behalf of their loved ones upon discharge from the hospital. And so that element of giving family caregivers some training about wound care or medication management, uh, operating nebulizers, whatever it may be, uh, that is a critical part prior to discharge. And so uh, for uh, AARP, we've been advocating in states across the country and with Susan's help, we're now also looking at the imp implementation of those laws uh, across the country uh, and uh, in trying to get the word out that those are laws in your state so you do have those rights as family caregivers uh, upon hospital admission of a loved one. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And Susan, um, in the states that have enacted the CARE Act, how do you believe implementation is going? And are, what are some of the early results and takeaways that you're seeing? So we're going back to some of the early states that passed this, like, you know, the first ones, uh, like Oklahoma and New Jersey. We've been to uh, many different site visits in Michigan, Illinois. I could tell you a list of them, uh, but there are many. And we continue to do this. And our, our goal is to surface good ideas. Like, <laughs> this isn't an inspection. This is more of share with us. How are you identifying family caregivers? For example, that's a whole theme. So the CARE Act starts by saying, as Elaine just described, you know, is there somebody who's helping you when you go home to do these kinds of things that you're going to need? And then, you know, would you like the person's name in the medical record, the health care record? And then, you know, if they do, then we, you must offer instruction if they're going to be doing these things. It seems very simple. And many people will say, well, doesn't that happen already? And we would say our research says, well, sometimes. <laughs> but not yes, all the time. Yes, exactly. So that's the point. You know, how do we make this a really routine thing for everybody as opposed to, you know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So we have a, we have a number of research teams that are going out and about, and we include a focus talking to consumers as well as talking to the nurse leaders, the social workers, the physicians, the pharmacists, the care managers. We're really trying to dig into what's going on. And some of the interesting things have been like that first question, how do you identify a family caregiver? So, you know, I mean, a lot of people think automatically it's your next of kin. You know, if you come in and I have right. a husband, it must be your husband. Well, you know what? It may not be. It may be my daughter that's going to be doing this or my next door neighbor. So don't make those assumptions. So we've been trying to break through kind of the stereotypes. Who is the next of kin may not be the right thing, or even the legal guardian. It's really who's doing this care that we're interested in this particular case. Of course we care about the guardian, but who, who needs to learn this and learn how to do this kind of work? So we've been working with how do you do that? How do you ask those questions? You can't say family caregiver. People don't know what that means. So you say, you know, who's going to be there when you get home? Who's going to take you to the doctor's office? Is there someone that's going to help you with your medications? Those kinds of things. And then you might have to change your whole electronic health record system to change that. What is that like? What are some of the best <laughs> ways of doing that? You yes. know, just truthfully, how do you recognize the family caregiver? These are people that are, you know, very busy nurses, doctors, social workers. Go, so I just heard the other day that an average patient sees 100 different people in their room every day. 100 wow. people. Just think about that. You're the patient and you're like the patient's wife or sister or daughter. You're seeing all these people like, and these people are ignoring you by and large, right? They're doing whatever they have to do. So how do you get recognized, especially around the healthcare team? So can we get the family caregiver, maybe more than one, included in discussions with the, particularly the doctor and the pharmacist and other clinicians, the nurses, about what's going to happen afterwards? And some hospitals, one part, this is very simple, you're going to laugh, but one of the most simple, important things that we have found is a name tag that it says, I'll say, Susan Reinhardt, family caregiver. And that name tag, when I go down to the cafeteria, gets me a discount, just as the nurse gets a discount. It gives me a discount in the gift shop. You would think, like, oh, come That's on. That's awesome. But it is. It is yeah. awesome, right? That's so let's a wonderful start with some respect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
So we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a bit. Uh, We are coming to you live from the BBAM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show, and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show. And just before the break, I, we were learning more about the, the Caregiver Act. And um, I think you were telling us a little bit more about some of the ideas and things that people were putting in place that seemed to really be helping to identify who the caregiver might be. And you had started to share with us the caregiver name tag that would make it obvious that this is the person that really is the one that's responsible for helping that person with their care when they go home. And I thought it was pretty awesome that they could get a discount in a gift shop at the hospital as well as cafeteria. And would you like to say a little bit more about some of the things you're seeing that show that uh, it's starting to make a difference? Sure. Well, one of the things we've been trying to do is Take what kind of resources can we develop? So when we make these visits, really great hospitals and health systems will say, oh, okay, we get it. What more can we do? And so we started developing uh, videos because we realized that the, you know, materials, education materials were designed for teaching nursing students or, you know, other kinds of healthcare professionals, not caregivers. And so we started developing, and we are, in fact, we are right now are in the field developing them, um, videos where the caregiver is actually in the video. And let's say the nurse or it could be a dietitian is teaching the family caregiver and the patient, the person, about what has, you know, what they need to do. Because mainly the family caregivers are not, it's not like they wanted to be trained like a nurse to do this their entire life for many, many people they are doing this for their family member, neighbor, or friend, and and uh, they really are a little nervous, right? So these Absolutely. videos are kind of telling a story, and uh, there's sort of voiceovers, and there's tip sheets on how do you give an injection? How do you do a tube feeding? How would you change a dressing, different kinds of dressings? So we have these videos available on our ARP website. We also have, a, we call them how-to videos. Uh, and it's under www.arp slash no longer alone. And in addition to that, we have other, lots of other resources that ARP does uh, to help family caregivers. Um, that is just on arp.org slash or forward slash caregiving. So ARP in general has been trying very hard to address the needs that people tell us they have as family caregivers, working, by the way, with other organizations that have been doing this for many years, 
but trying to translate it, frankly, into different languages, but also into the language that consumers would be more comfortable with. So we're really working hard on this direct to consumer kind of information, but at the same time, trying to use this to teach professionals how to talk to family caregivers. Like you can't just say, this will be easy. Let me show you this will be easy because as soon as you say that, which I'm sure I did, it's like, oh, God, I can't ask a question or I'll be stupid. Yep, absolutely. Well, that's wonderful work. I really applaud uh, the fact that you're really pushing on that, and it's great that you're seeing so many improvements. I'd like for us to talk about another really important area that you all are working on, and that is to really look at modernizing the the state scope of practice to improve healthcare access and support family caregivers. And this is one that's dear to my heart because I live in Texas and we still have a lot of restrictions on advanced practice nurses and we keep working at it. So maybe, um, Elaine, maybe you could tell us a bit more, more about how does improving customer access to advanced practice nurse care help family caregivers and older adults? Well, you know, the effort that we're uh, undertaking uh, as a national campaign uh, on scope of practice has been uh, really powerful in state legislatures. And yes, we've made progress, and I think we're up to uh, more than 20 states that have changed their scope of practice laws. But I think um, the biggest advocates uh, for these changes have become uh, the patients and consumers themselves. You know, I, it makes good sense that uh, nurses should be able to practice up to the full extent of their education and training. And when you get into a situation where there are uh, shortages of healthcare workers, where um, there are uh, professionals who have been trained uh, to do uh, a certain tasks, but State laws and arcane regulations keep them from practicing. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And I think that the most powerful argument we've been able to advance um, in this area in state legislatures uh, throughout the country is that, and as Susan mentioned earlier, you know, our healthcare workforce is uh, in large measure uh, family caregivers, but when it comes to the professional workforce, um, nurses uh, are a key part uh, of of that workforce. And if we're not leveraging every bit an ounce of knowledge and training they have, uh, then we're not doing our best to build a system of healthcare in this country that best meets the needs uh, of consumers. And so. I think that the case has been made. In some states, we've got an uphill battle, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're active this year in eight different state legislatures trying to make the case to do away with those restrictions uh, that, frankly, uh, don't make uh, a lot of sense, business sense or professional sense. Is there uh, some work potentially that could be uh, augmented as we start to see CVS, Walgreens, Walmart entering in, trying to also come up with some innovative ways to improve access to care? And I believe they're, they're using advanced practice nurses as part of their model. Is is that another yes. like group that we should be working with? Yes, yeah, exactly. so we do. It, Yeah, I would just say that um, years ago when Target had a a network of uh, uh, care clinics, um, the CEO of Target was uh, was very much uh, an advocate of changing the scope of practice laws. And I think at that time uh, led an effort in Minnesota to actually modernize uh, those changes and uh, across the country now is. Uh, Walmart and others have uh, moved into these care clinics. Uh, they're seeing that it makes business sense that if you have a national model and you have to go state by state to change the rules and regulations, it doesn't make a lot of business sense. They've been powerful advocates, and we need more people to step up uh, to make the case. 
That's wonderful. Um, this is all about nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and it's time for us to take a short break. There are artists, and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Les Col des Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show. And before the break, my two guests that I have on the show, Elaine Ryan and Susan Reinhardt, were telling us about a lot of fabulous work that they're leading at ARP. And uh, one of the things they were sharing with us is how they're really trying to help look at the full practice authority for advanced practice nurses to really address access to care, which I think is exciting to, to hear. And Maybe we could transition to um, you all telling us a little bit more about new and emerging trends in the family caregiving and how to prepare for the aging population. Because that was pretty interesting as you were talking about that earlier, just how many more baby boomers are people that are aging and what that's going to mean in terms of numbers of caregivers per person. So, Susan, yeah, can you it start? Is. And if, you know, I mentioned um, uh, if you can, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but, but the, no, no. this is Susan about the. Uh, Millennial caregivers that one in four is a millennial caregiver, and so that's and, and Gen Z is right behind them. So these, you know, we I told you sixty percent are working, and employers are particularly interested in that statistic of one in four is a millennial because it starts to wake them up. That just look around your workforce here, just walk around the office and say, ooh, there's this one and this one and that one. And by the way, they're doing this complex health care, too. This isn't just I'm going to go food shopping for mom. Yes, and I'm going to do a lot more. And they, you know, millennials in particular, every generation has issues that they need to deal with. But these, you're at an age where you're deciding, am I going to get married? Am I going to have children? Can I take this job in California if I live in Delaware? You know, all those things as you're forming those, that basic infrastructure of your life can be completely focused now on providing pretty intense and complex care. So we have been talking with people of all ages, but in particular trying to get employers to understand that workplace flexibility is important, really understanding that people are afraid to speak up, that they even have to, have to do these kinds of things because they might ha- be discriminated against in the workforce. So um, those are both uh, private sector issues and public policy issues that we are trying to address. That's wonderful. And Elaine, how have policymakers responded to the needs of family caregivers, and what kind of trends are you seeing in some of the states you're working with? 
Well, it's been exciting uh, to see uh, uh, the family caregiver issue really take hold in state legislatures across the country. You know, since we launched our campaign in 2014, uh, we've seen more than 450 new state laws to support family caregivers and their loved ones. And those laws include uh, things like um, expanded respite care, uh, workplace flexibility, uh, supportive uh, in-home services, uh, tax credits to support families. So working stipends uh, for family caregivers. So um, there is a full array of ideas and there are so many diverse needs for for family caregivers. The, the greatest, uh, to me, the most heartening part about the work in this area is that it's widely bipartisan. So we've had on average three laws enacted in every state and territory in this country over uh, the past uh, several years. And so uh, the current trends and the, what's trending this year, and Susan picked up on this as uh, working family caregivers, one of the big things is workplace flexibility. So this session, we're seeing a number of states uh, step up on paid family leave. And often that pam family leave is for new parents or adoptive parents. Uh, but these laws are now expanding that to extend to family caregivers as well. So if you need to leave the workforce uh, for a period of time, you'd have paid leave to do so. Uh, the other piece is a model bill that ARP has uh, a, has introduced in a number of states, and uh, it was passed in Georgia, it was passed in Illinois, it was passed in New Mexico, and it does this. If your employer gives you sick leave, then you may use it for family caregiving purposes. And I know that seems odd, but in this country, you can only use sick leave if you are sick, but not if you're caring for a loved one. So we're moving state to state to actually change that provision uh, to recognize that family caregiving uh, duties uh, are, are important to recognize in the employment setting. And, and now in a tight labor market, we're seeing states step up and using these workplace flexibility changes to attract and keep good workers uh, who are also family caregivers. So uh, lots of things going on in the states, and we're uh, not giving up until we uh, can fully support uh, family caregivers and their loved ones. That's wonderful. Um, I, I, I know that... Um we see some differences sometimes we look at other countries in terms of the kind of support they get for taking care of their families. I was just wondering if employers are getting concerned about the costs of having those added benefits in terms of paid time for someone to be able to take care of their loved one. Are you hearing that as you all are doing this work? Well, I would just offer that um, in, a, in a really, I think, compelling change, uh, this year, we've seen state uh, uh, state governments, uh, governors in their state of the state messages in Idaho, in West Virginia, in Tennessee, say it's time to give their state employees paid family leave. And I will tell you, that is a sign of the times that points to the fact that um, of providing that kind of benefit is critical to retaining good workers in a state workforce. Uh, perhaps that will also extend uh, to private employers who see the same benefit in extending that kind of leave to their employees. Well, that's wonderful. Um, is there anything else that you all would like to share on other kinds of uh, things that you're seeing? Any other examples that you've seen states doing or? Well, I just want to mention one thing that Elaine would certainly agree, that this is not a partisan issue. Family caregiving is, a, a, I would call, a soci I'm a sociologist to a normative issue. We all experience this. We know somebody, we either are or are going to be, or we know somebody is. It's just become so 
pervasive that employers themselves are often family caregivers or they know somebody. So it's not, you know, it's it's a very unifying um, discussion. I think that's part of the reason the CARE Act really moves so quickly across the states to be 43 states and territories in such a short time because, you know, our ARP volunteers, but many others, came out in droves to talk about their personal experiences. So the, the time is ripe for policy change. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely correct. This is wonderful. This is all about nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we'll continue this conversation when we come back. Introducing BetterHomeAndGarden.com. That's www.BetterHomeAndGarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. BetterHomeAndGarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, BetterHomeAndGarden.com. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor covering, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. And international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the B. BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and all about nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I have my two guests with me this evening, Susan Reinhardt and Elaine Ryan, who have been just sharing so much wonderful work uh, that the ARP is uh, doing, and their leadership impact is incredible. I'd like to go back to, through the conversations that we've had this evening. I, you all have said how nurses are critical to patients and their family caregivers, both at the bedside and in the policy arena. Nursing has its roots in addressing social determinants and all the factors that contribute to someone's health and well-being. In many ways, nurses are uniquely positioned to help Americans live their healthiest and best lives. So I'll start with you, Elaine. What advice would you give to nurses who want to support AARP's work on health care and family caregiving issues? Well, and, and, you know, this is an all due respect because nurses are so busy, but I would say if you have an opportunity, uh, uh, please step into that public policy arena. What you're seeing in, on the front lines of your work uh, is essential for policymakers to learn about and your ideas of how to improve the system is critical to making those improvements. So uh, for me, uh, the thing that nurses can do is, uh, is realize they're the most powerful advocate for change. And I'm thinking of my dear sweet mama who used to say, uh, when she saw something go awry, she would say, Elaine, uh, this system, something is radically wrong. She knew that certain policies didn't make a lot of sense. She knew they were more costly or they were actually hurting uh, patients' outcomes. Uh, so nurses can see that uh, so clearly. Um, using that intelligence and experience to paint a picture for lawmakers about how to make the changes that will improve 
their lives and the lives of their patients. Thank you so much. Um, and Susan, how can nurses translate their experiences and expertise in healthcare into transformative policy changes for their patients and the community? Thank you. Um, thanks for that question because I've been thinking about this for many years. I used to teach nurses. I used to bring students to the New Jersey State Legislature. It was amazing. as a clinical experience, by the way. And they would just stop. You know, I'd just point out, well, that's a senator from so-and-so place, and that person from that constituency would go up and talk to them. So the two parts I would say is, first of all, there are a lot of us. There are 4 million nurses in the United States. And that means we know a lot of people, right? So most yes. people I talk to know a nurse. It's a wife, a daughter, a brother, a husband, uh, whatever. There's a lot of nurses, and there's incredible trust. For decades now, we keep coming up in all these surveys as the most trusted profession in the world. The only time we didn't work number one, we were second to firefighters in 9-11. I mean, this, we have amazing trust. And we have stories because we have these direct experiences that we can translate, uh, you know, what's going on with people to explain the problems, for example. So, but the other, the second part I would say is you don't have to do this alone. It's pretty intimidating to think, oh, I got to go to the state legislature or to Congress. I mean, give me a break. So what do you do? Well, you know, if you're interested in a particular topic, you have a passion. There are many things that nurses are passionate about. You know, you know, work with either your state nurses association. The ARP state offices would love to have you. I was talking to the New Jersey state office, and they said, look, at, I just, like, open it up and bring the nurse forward, and they tell all the stories. So you don't have to do it alone. Just figure out what you're interested in and find those that can help you can partner with. That's wonderful. I want to thank both of you for being on the show this evening, and I want to thank you for the amazing leadership and, and outcomes that you're having. And I would say keep going because the work you're leading is extremely important. So thank you again. You are listening to All About Nursing live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of this show, and I hope that you'll tune in again next week. Thank you. You've been listening to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Tune in each week and get a daily dose of nursing and the healthcare services they provide and how nurses are finding innovative ways to address the key healthcare issues they're facing today here on Dr. Joyce Batchelor's All About Nursing. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.